You didn't start out in the beauty industry, surprisingly enough. No, long ago, I, mean, I was 22 years old. That was a long, that was long Yes, ago. yes. I started out in the retail business, but before that, I, I think I'd like to go back a little bit further, all the way to when I was born, if you don't mind. That was before even ESCOM. <laughs> Through no fault of my own, I was born in Funnobel Park. And, and people always said to me, why were you born in Funnobel Park? I mean, and that's a hell of a question. And I thought, because I wanted fault. to be close to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I came to Joburg, and I think one of the big lessons in my life appeared or came about when I went to school. I was sent to a Jewish school, um, and that was quite something because you don't get to meet anyone else other than Jews, of course. And that's, you know, and that's fairly limiting in terms of exposure to the world. And, uh, and we were told by our teachers and the local rabbi that we, the Jews, were the chosen people of God, which is cool. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to be special? Who wouldn't want to be special? So you grow up like that very naively, and then you, you think that you're really special. And then I left school, and I went into the Air Force, and I met another group of people there that were Afrikaans, white, male-type people. And I thought I was pretty special, but I can tell you for sure that they didn't think so. Because they knew that they that, were special. That, that's exactly right. Yes. One guy said, and I know we're not live on air, so you can cut this out. One guy said, as far as he was concerned, uh, that Jews were lower than shark shit. And uh, I've been, you know, over the last 45 years, I've been trying to work out if there's anything in the world lower than shark shit. And I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't actually come up with anything. But, was, but what is more I'm interesting... I'm sure that somebody would put it into a treatment somewhere for a patient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But the important thing was that these guys were telling me that they were the chosen people of God. And that was quite interesting for us and a real dilemma in terms of my growing up because, you know, which is quite difficult. One day I'm a hero and I'm chosen by God. And next day I'm shark shit, lower than, you know, lower than anything else. And, and that's really quite a difficult thing. And then you start asking the question, who's doing the choosing here? And why is he so confused? And, and, uh, and eventually you learn, and I think perhaps the most important lesson of my entire life, especially living in South Africa at the age of 18, is that there's no one group that is superior or inferior to anyone else. You just, we're all just different, and the sooner we can accept and respect our differences, we'd be having a much better country. But that in, that's informed your entire life, and it's Correct. informed the way you've structured businesses throughout exactly. your life, and it's informed the way you've run your businesses, because you, was, you were quite a naughty white South African in the 1970s and 80s, because you had a supermarket in downtown Johannesburg, yes. where not only did you allow black and white people to shop next to each other. Correct. Yeah, um, that, but you yeah. even had black managers. That's right, we had black managers. And but, and which was revolutionary. For people who don't remember 25 years ago, yes. 40 years ago, that was high-risk stuff. And I think we were the first company in South Africa to have black shareholders and directors as well. So that was something um, quite different at the time, yes. No, but take me through the thinking of that in, at that time, where I mean, you, you had security branch spying on you, yeah, you had people yeah. um, doing all sorts of things. It was terribly good for your customers and terribly good for the business because customers quite liked your approach. Correct. We had a business called Kmart, which was a big retail operation that we had stolen from America. Um, you hadn't stolen yeah, it, you might have borrowed we, it for we, a bit. We, we just used their name and their logo without permission. <laughs> it was sanctions. It, yes. I was 22, what do I know about trademarks? <laughs> <and stuff? laughs> so, uh, but the important thing is it was aimed at the black market and there were very few white people. In fact, I was the only white boy in the whole place. So, so we had uh, black customers and, bla and black staff. And, the, and, you know, it just seemed natural then to have black shareholders and directors as well that understood the market we were aiming at, because I had no idea. I was very young and naive. And that whole learning process was important, and these guys became our mentors at the time. You, you learned to understand your market. You learned to understand your customers. You spoke directly to your customers. Yeah. In a bit in the same way as Raymond Ackerman for Middle Class South Africa learned the business of retailing, talking to his customers, you did a very similar thing. Yes, indeed we did. We tried to understand, we tried to know what the impact was of people living in the impartate you know, environment. We tried to understand the impact of that on their lives in terms of staffing. We would try and go out and see how people lived. So there was a lot of things. And of course, we opened right in the middle of this Sweater uprising. So mm. it was 1976. 
And that was a very traumatic time. You, you did get shut down eventually because the Americans did hear about you. Yes, they came. And they came to visit you and they were terribly impressed with what you were doing. Yeah, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> they, they came 12 years later, in fact, and we thought, you know, we went to our lawyers and our lawyers said, no, it's fine, you know, you've been operating for 12 years, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, and, and they came with a team of, of lawyers that really, were, you know, it was quite an intimidating bunch. And, and we lost hopelessly. Uh, and we had to change our name to Supermart. Some people might remember Supermart, yeah. It subsequently was sold to Edcon and is now called Jetmart. So I don't know if you know that business. There we go. The well, origins Jet, of Jetmart. That's right. It was Kmart, was Supermart, now Jetmart. So that experience, though, in running Kmart, yes. then Supermart, then, then Jetmart, um, leads you in a tumultuous period in South African history in the early 1990s. There's change happening, there's transformation happening, the world is changing really quickly, and you then go, hold on a second, there's another wonderful business idea, because having experienced uh, God's other chosen people in the army, um, you realize that there was going to be something of a, a hiccup in transformation in the workplace. Um, exactly. I think through the supermarket experience, I realized that if you couldn't understand the socio-political environment and the impact of racism in the workplace, you would never be able to understand why South Africa had such a low productivity level. So I went out and I tried to be a race relations consultant. At first, people just laughed at me. Obviously, I had no academic background because I had very successfully dropped out of university. I, um, and, and then, and become a singer. And <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, yes, you were uh, a bar fly and a I bar singer. I was a bar singer, singer you know. Thinking, thinking about, thinking about Cohen, making you, money. You could do Leonard Cohen, couldn't you? No. If I were a rich man. But you are a rich man. All day long I'd bitty bitty bum. If I were a wealthy man. Hey. Hey. I wouldn't have to work hard. If any, uh, Peter Turin, if you're looking. <laughs> we have, what was his yeah. name? What, Sorry. what was the character's name? Fiddler on the Roof? Um, I'm uh, thinking Yentl, but that's Barbara Streisand, and it's a completely different thing. Yeah. Anyway, um, not, uh, yeah, you, you go into to, to race relations, uh, you, but you run a, a very successful business. Um, you do videos, you do corporate videos, you go into companies and you help them with transformation processes. How does that end? Okay, so what we did to get into that industry was to create industrial theatre, because it was very, very difficult to convince large corporates, and that was my target market with the large corporates. Uh, um, to come in and work on race issues. That it was a very sensitive area, so we, we created industrial theatre and, and the, we did these plays in these companies and highlighted the issues of racism in there. And that's how we got into the industry and then we, for the next seven years we consulted on, on racial polarisation in the workplace and it was a very, very stimulating and rewarding period of my life, very challenging, but I think at the end of the day I felt that we had made a difference, even in a tiny little way, in helping the, the, the transformation process in South Africa.